This is the video for B3.3 on muscles and motility. It's a higher level topic, and we'll be diving deeper into joints and locomotion. And here's a great connection to your Lang and Lit class, right? So the antagonist in a story is someone who's doing like the opposite thing as the hero, right? Well, we have the same meaning here for antagonistic muscle pairs. All of your muscles come in pairs because muscles can only accomplish one movement. The only thing muscles can do is pull. So for a muscle to pull, it can go in one direction, but if you want your joint to move in the opposite direction, you need a muscle that will pull in the opposite direction. So all muscles occur in antagonistic pairs because they pull in the opposite directions. So a great example here is your bicep and tricep. So your bicep is going to be located here and your tricep is located here. Your bicep is great for flexing your elbow, but if you want to straighten it back out, you need your tricep to contract and to straighten out your arm. Now, this relates to that protein Titan. Remember, Titan is going to connect the myosin to the Z lines. When your sarcomeres relax, what they're doing is they're actually stretching that Titan and it becomes like a rubber band and it can actually make um, recoil um, and a real forceful contraction when that antagonistic muscle pair also needs to contract. So it helps out with that antagonistic movement. Now, in order for a muscle contraction to take place, it needs to receive a message from a nerve, okay? And this spot where a neuron meets a muscle fiber is called a neuromuscular junction. Junction means place where they join. Neuro is the neuron part and then muscle. So this neuromuscular junction is going to be a spot where the nerves and the muscles communicate and they communicate via neurotransmitters. So if you haven't yet studied the topic on nerve transmission, that's okay. Um, for now, we can just say that neurotransmitters are chemical messenger molecules that travel um, from one neuron to either a muscle or another neuron, something like that. And the one that is involved in muscle contraction is called acetylcholine. So acetylcholine will be passed from the nerve to the motor unit or to that muscle. So altogether, this neuron and the muscle fibers that it controls is called the motor unit. You'll notice in this picture that one neuron can connect to multiple muscle fibers. So each of these long skinny things is a muscle fiber or a muscle cell. And this one motor neuron is going to connect to many muscle uh, fibers here, and that helps to coordinate their contraction. So if we want an entire muscle made up of many muscle fibers to all contract at the same time, it's helpful that they're all connected to the same nerve. So we know that muscles provide the pulling force, but what does our skeleton do? In addition to providing like protection, it can also serve as an attachment point for our muscles. Now, it turns our joints into a lever, and in order for a lever to work, we need two attachment points, one that moves and one that does not. So let's consider um, this joint here, okay? So I have a muscle that connects this part of the lever with this part. I have a part that does not move and it is attached by a muscle to a part that does move. When the muscle contracts, it moves the lever and it all pivots around this central point here called a fulcrum. Now there's a, a relationship between the force and the distance moved, okay? So the attachment points and where they are attached, it can determine not only the range of motion, but the force that you can get out of that. It's one of the reasons why insects have incredible abilities. They can jump like 10 times their body height and things like that um, because they have different attachment points and different amounts of force that they can create with these levers. But it's just right now important to understand that your muscles are going to attach to two things on either side of a joint, okay, one that moves 
and one that doesn't move. And when the muscle pulls, it can help move that lever. Next, we're going to do a drawing of a synovial joint. Now, I'm not going to draw a specific joint in the body. I'm just going to draw a generalized synovial joint so we can see all the pieces and how they fit together. Joints, of course, connect two bones, okay? So here's one bone, here's another bone, and we have some connective tissue that joins the two bones together. And those bits of connective tissue are called ligaments. And these ligaments connect bones to bones. They're there to help stabilize the joint. There's probably a ligament on this side as well, but I don't want our drawing to get too complicated. Now, what we know about joints is that they are moved by muscles. So I'm going to draw in a muscle um, somewhere up here. And muscles move joints by attaching to the bone. So this muscle is going to have two attachment points, one to each of the bones surrounding the joint. And you can kind of imagine how if this muscle contracted, it would pull this bone upward in this direction. And that is due to these connections. And these pieces of connected tissue are called tendons. Tendons are what connect a muscle to a bone. So here's one tendon, here is another one. Now, if these bones were to move and rub up against each other, there would be a lot of friction and that would be very painful. So at the end of bones, we're going to find this very slick type of tissue called cartilage. And cartilage is there to reduce the friction between two bones in a joint. So if you take apart bones, um, you'll notice this like slippery um, type stuff at the ends, that's our cartilage. Now, because this is a synovial joint, there's going to be an additional structure here that helps even further reduce the cartilage, and that is something called a synovial capsule. So I've done that here in green, all right? So we can see this capsule is just the edge of it, so this whole thing is called the synovial capsule. It is filled with a fluid inside called the synovial fluid, and again, that's there to help further reduce the friction. So this isn't a real realistic or complete picture of any particular joint in the body, but all synovial joints are going to have these components. It's going to have bones, muscles to move the bone. There would also be a muscle on this side because muscles come in antagonistic pairs. This muscle is only capable of flexion. I would need another one back here capable of extending that joint. We're going to have ligaments that connect the bones together. Again, tendons that connect muscle to bone. I should be finding cartilage and synovial capsules and fluid to help further reduce that friction. All right, so let's talk about a couple different types of joints. There are several, but we'll only highlight two, one of which is called a hinge joint, okay? And so this is a joint that's very stable, but it has a relatively limited range of motion. So kind of like your elbow, or here I have a knee. <laughs> this knee can either extend or it can flex, but it can only go in that one direction. So again, um, very stable, but limited in its range of motion. That's going to be different than a ball and socket joint. So a ball and socket joint, we're going to find these in like our shoulder or our hip, okay? And so when I think about how I can move my shoulder, I can do lots of things. I can do rotation, adduction, abduction, protraction, retraction. I have a much wider range of motion. It's not as stable. We need some more stabilizing features, right? Like some ligaments and stuff, um, but just a very different type of joint that allows for a different range range of motion. And you can measure this with something called a goniometer. Ooh, great IA idea. Um, this is a measurement tool that allows you to measure joint angles. And so you can investigate range of motion for different types of joints or the same type of joint in different people or in different ages. There are a lot of independent variables that you can look into um, using this goniometer. 
Now, if you've already studied gas exchange, this might sound familiar to you, but if not, that's okay. We're going to talk about an example of an antagonistic muscle pair, and this example comes from our intercostal muscles. So inter means between, costal refers to your ribs. So these are the muscles that are in between your rib bones, okay? And so they'll be right in here, and they're actually in the same spot, but they're oriented in a different way. Way. So we'll refer to them like this. So we'll have external intercostal muscles, which I will abbreviate with an E. And then we will have internal intercostal muscles, which I will abbreviate with an I. So if I say I, I just mean internal intercostal. And so they um, accomplish different movements. When we are inhaling, what's happening to our rib cage is that it is moving up and out and that is going to cause it to expand. So that rib cage is getting bigger, okay? And that is due to the contraction of our external intercostal muscles. They are um, contracting to really open up that rib cage. When we are exhaling, what we want to do is we want to make that um, rib cage move inward, okay, and down, and that is going to make your rib cage um, smaller, okay, so whoof, okay, something like that, and that's going to be due to the contraction of your internal intercostal muscles. Aside from breathing, there are lots of reasons why organisms might utilize this idea of locomotion. So remember, locomotion is the movement of a whole organism. Not all living things can do that. Motion could refer to just movement within an organism, but locomotion is kind of special actually. And so this might be like anything from finding food, getting away from predators, finding a mate, migrating, lots of different reasons reasons why organisms would have evolved the ability to have locomotion. And we'll wrap up this video with some special locomotive adaptations for animals whose common ancestors lived on land, but now these current species live in the water. So we're talking about marine mammals, whales, dolphins, things like that. Okay, so they evolved on land, but now they live in the water, they need special adaptations. One of which is they have a streamlined body shape. So you can kind of see that here, okay, that they're not going to meet a lot of resistance from the water as they are swimming through it. So that's very helpful. You'll notice that they've um, kind of gotten rid of most of the hair or fur on their body to reduce friction as they're swimming through the water. Water is a lot more viscous than air. So animals that live in the water, um, need to have adaptations for that. They also have a very different airway system. In your ventilation system, your mouth attaches to your lungs. And that's good, we live on land, everything works fine there. If you live in the, the water, however, you're probably using your mouth to capture prey and do a lot of other things. Well, if your mouth is open while you're swimming, water would go into your lungs and that's bad. So in these marine mammals, they, there is actually no connection between their mouth and their lungs. There is a connection between uh, a hole at the top called a blowhole, and it's the blowhole that leads into their lungs, not the mouth. So that's really interesting. And then in the last bit here, this is about just adaptations for living in the water. Um, they have fins and flippers instead of tails. There's still a pentadactyl limb. There's still some fingers in there, which is a really great example of homologous structures, if you've already covered that. And then they also have blubber here. And that blubber does a couple of things. It increases buoyancy, but it also helps prevent any um, or reduces the loss of body heat to the environment. So some really great and very cool adaptations uh, for locomotion depending on environment and needs.